On Sky News Australia, this is the Rita Panahi Show Overtime. Welcome to the Rita Panahi Show Overtime. We have a huge program coming up from the voice fallout, the continuing tragedy in Israel, and of course, plenty of lefties losing it. And for all the news, we've got Sky News contributor Kosha Gator is here with me. Kosha, let's start with the Australian left, and they're not coping well with the comprehensive defeat of their attempt to insert racial pri privilege into the Constitution. The meltdown has been widespread and frankly hilarious some of it has been hilarious we've seen our cricketers needing counseling we've had guardian journos calling the whole country racist and then we have the project and waleed ali's remarks which are many are seeing as sneering and condescending the biggest dividing line seems to be education so if you are in a seat that had high levels of tertiary education a bachelor or postgrad then you were, you were at the very top end of the yes vote. And if you had the lowest levels of tertiary education, you were at the, the low end of the yes vote. And that's not to say people who are educated know what they're doing and people who don't have tertiary education don't. Yeah. It's about the style of the, the message, I think. Oh, yes, all those silly people who don't have higher education who are obviously, I don't know, too stupid to understand the complexities of inserting racial privilege into the Constitution. What do you make of the fallout? Uh, I think it's been very instructive in, in more ways than one. Uh, you know, for one, it's sort of showing where there actually is consensus on, a, on an issue in a country that's mm. getting increasingly divided. It's kind of nice to see any issue where there's consensus, 60% of the population. It is instructive in those dividing lines of the electorate, such as what this, um, all, all these people alluded to in, in your setup educated versus non-educated, working class or middle classes versus elites. Mm. We see that around the world, whether it's US presidential elections, exactly. whether it's Brexit, that same kind of divide shows up. And I think it's because a lot of these things at their heart are these esoteric issues and they're framed in moralistic terms. And it's almost a luxury for, for people, sort of the, the laptop class or the Tesla class, as they're known as, to <laughs> subscribe to those things, whereas people that are struggling with cost of living and everything just don't have time for, for these kinds of things. And they don't like being called, you know, racist or, or bigoted, and yeah. I think that's what you're talking about. I think it's just, frankly, so simplistic to try to use the uh, the notion that, oh, because they're more educated back this, it's because the, the proposal was... Uh, complex and they understand the, the depth of the proposal. No, it, it has nothing to do with that. What it has to do with is the fact that we talked about that trend that we have seen in the UK, in the US, where the privilege, the, the most affluent seats are trending increasingly left, and this is very much a leftist pursuit. And the working classes, the aspirational classes, their values are very different from from the racial politics and obsessions with identity politics. So this shouldn't surprise anybody who's been paying attention. And, and in contrast to some of the idiotic uh, meltdowns and analysis that we have seen, let's have a look at this piece from Nick Cater, who wrote a really superb piece in The Australian with some great data points. And this data I found particularly fascinating. He wrote, the five seats with the largest proportion of Indigenous residents, they being, they being at Lingiari, Parks, Leichhardt, Jurak and Kennedy, they voted no by an average of 71%. The results in the five electorates with the smallest Indigenous populations, we're talking here about 0.2%, 0.3% seats like Goldstein, Chisholm, Bradfield, Kuyong and Higgins, well, they average 56% in favour. And that's what I was talking about, there, the affluent uh, upper classes who also do tend to be more educated, so that's where that uh, university graduate uh, stat comes in. They back this, but they are so removed from this issue. They, they, they have no Indigenous community amongst them. They don't. It's kind of, you know, if you live in coastal cities or big cities and you're in sort of a professional class that doesn't 
require interfacing with those folks. You're getting your food delivered by Uber Eats. You're like consuming Netflix. You really are living in a little bit of an echo chamber, a bubble, um, and you just see that more and more around the Western sphere. It's really interesting. You know, another analogy here is a Hispanic vote in the U.S. is increasingly mm. getting stricter and tougher towards immigration and illegal immigration, and often people uh, from these out-of-touch pockets assume that people will always vote in that favor, and you don't. You see immigrants kind of being often the strongest against immigration, and you see the indigenous here voting a resounding no, which is very instructive. And also with the Hispanic community, a very uh, conservative, culturally conservative community. So some of the excesses of the trans movement, some of the uh, the left's uh, pet issues really are, are at odds with their values. Um, now, one of the reasons why the no vote had such a decisive, comprehensive win in every state and even the Northern Territory, only ACT voted yes, what was the quality of the Indigenous leaders who advocated the no vote? Uh, future PM, Jacinta Price, you heard it here first, and Warren Mundine were stalwarts. And it was a tireless campaign, particularly from those two. It did take its toll. Warren Mundine has spoken about the ugly attacks against him and how it pushed him to the brink. And after the victory, Warren Mundine's patience for silly questions from journalists was, well, well and truly over. There's a lot of manipulation. Um, you, you know what? You know what? Um, um, people are committing suicides in these communities. People are being raped and beaten. And this is the questions you come up with. Where's the, about getting results? Mm. Getting people reducing suicide and instead of this nonsense that you people carry on with. It's about time. We had a vote tonight that said Australians want to get things done. Kosha, what will happen next? Will we have an inquiry into where these uh, billions are going? Why are we having such poor outcomes despite the enormous expenditure? Maybe, although I think when a country's approaching a trillion dollars in debt, uh, I don't think an inquiry and spending is probably going to be at the top of the list for a lot of people, though it, maybe it should. Um, I will say this, though. The flip side to this argument is 40% of the country still did vote yes. And some would say that's probably surprising. If this had theoretically taken place 30, 40 years ago, you might have seen a bigger split. Mm. So I don't think um, that that agenda has been defeated necessarily, even though this referendum went down the way it did. Mm. You're seeing state legislatures already pushing ahead with versions of this. Um, you're going to see other rules and regulations coming through in society indirectly around it to, to press on. And so I think labor will you know, continue with this agenda taking a different shape or form, just not as a constitutional amendment. Well, it was it did become party political. So though a lot of Labor voters voted against it, I think a lot of them would have voted for it because Labor Party Albanese was so tireless in, in pushing it and the overwhelming majority of Greens voted for it. So it was just, yeah, along those leftist conservative party lines. Now, as the fallout from the unprecedented attacks against Israel continues... There are clear signs that Iran played a major role, not just in funding the atrocities, but planning them. During a 60-minute interview, President Joe Biden had this to say when asked about growing tensions in the region, and he had a message for Hezbollah, which uh, controls regions in southern Lebanon. There's limited fighting already on the northern Israeli border, and I wonder what is your message to Hezbollah and its backer, Iran? Don't, 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 don't. Don't come across the border. Don't escalate this war. That's right. Akosha, the White House uh, under Biden is just weak, ineffectual, and it seems like it, it, it's an invitation almost to tyrants, whether they be in Iran, whether they be in China or Russia, to do as they wish. I think a lot of people are making that observation, certainly in terms of what happened in the four years of the previous administration versus now. Maybe it's all coincidence or maybe it is a direct consequence of the perception of the U.S. leadership being very weak and kind of not in control. Uh, I think he got the memo there about less is more. Just mm -hmm. one word, don't, 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 don't. is the answer. Uh, as opposed to when he, go, he freelances, he often steps in it, as we know. But, but the journalist stepped in and uh, finished his answer for him. Yep. And again, I don't think that actually conveys strength if, you, if you're looking on.
Right, and you're being uh, sort of handled by the journalists and the friendly media, and Scott Pelley, he, he tends to do that, sort of bake the answer into the question. Mm -hmm. um, th the next obvious question is, okay, don't, how so? The U.S. doesn't have a magic wand to say don't, so is he intimating that he's going to stop funding to Iran? The $6 billion, you know, that's got a lot of airplay that, that gets laundered through and you know, found its way into Hamas. Uh, are we going to stop funding and providing arms to Ukraine? Because there's an argument some of that ends up on the black market and finds its way into wrong hands. Uh, or is he intimating involvement, U.S. involvement? And the U.S. is very, very divided right now. And public opinion for increasing involvement and boots on the ground is dwindling by the day in the U.S. And a lot of people are worried about what that don't actually means. Now, across the ditch and the Ardern era has ended in infamy. Jacinda jump shipped as soon as the polls looked ugly. But her Labour Party was trounced at the weekend's general election. Christopher Luxon will become Prime Minister after defeating Ardern's replacement, Chris Hipkins. New Zealand Kosher is going to have a centre-right coalition. And I've got to say, the uh, lefty New Zealand media aren't coping too well. I, th I find it outrageous that anyone would suggest his own efforts got him across the line. I mean, he was bankrolled by the richest people in New Zealand. The game, the social media game behind him was amazing because that is bankrolled by foreign money. Um, he actually lost debates. He is not a, a people person. He got across the line because he represents everything that people with a lot of money would like to see as leader of New Zealand. And that's, right, that's you know, simply it. Kosha, the left seem to have a real problem accepting election results. I mean, uh, it's funny how outraged they were that Trump questioned the election result when they do this routinely from Al Gore onwards. It seems to be if an election goes against them, then there was some nefarious uh, force uh, behind the decision. Yeah, I think uh, that went viral on Twitter where people were saying cry more yeah. because it was uh, it was really a one-two punch in this part of the world with the referendum vote here and then in short period of time afterwards, uh, this vote over in New Zealand and a lot of the world is paying attention to that. Um, the intimation that there's something like 300 very, very wealthy, multi-multi-millionaire and above folks in New Zealand somehow controlled the will of millions of voters who voted in this way uh, is patronizing. I think, you know, people see it that way, and uh, they've just got to compete, I guess, in the marketplace of ideas if they want to take back the vote. Yes, uh, the New Zealand media is among the worst anyway. If you've ever travelled there and you listening to the radio or reading the papers, you will be shocked by just how almost uniformly left they are, and not just a little bit left, really left. Talking about left, let's look at some lefties losing it. Let's start lefties losing it with suicidally stupid protesters who are backing a regime that would imprison, torture and kill them. I'll be speaking to Alex Stein later in the show about a hilarious bit of comedy he created. This is what inspired it. To exalt the love. To exalt the love. And bring down hate. And bring down hate. But what can you say, Kosha? I mean, uh, I don't think I need to state what the laws in that part of the world are, not just in, in the Palestine-controlled uh, areas, but the, the wider Middle East, except Israel. Who's going to tell them? Who's going to tell them? <laughs> Israel's the only place you'd be safe, that mm -hmm. only place in the Middle East you have legal rights. Now, let's look at more anti-Israel activists uh, vandalising property this time in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So brave and powerful. Now, let's check out this charming lass in Glasgow, Scotland, telling Jews, remember where you were in 1940. I mean, this is just incredible. The uh, the things we are seeing on our streets, the, the ideas, the hate, the absolute uh, 
unashamed anti-Semitism. Uh, to, to say to Jewish people, remember where you were in 1940, 1945, I mean, I think it's it shocking. All... A young woman, probably yeah. born in Scotland. Right, probably. And Cambridge that you showed earlier is one of the richest zip codes in the nation and home to the best universities in the world. And they just are in that sort of... Uh, petri dish, I think, of, of issues. And a lot of those young people, I genuinely think that some of them know exactly what they're saying, but a lot of them actually don't know. And they just look at the whole world through this intersectionality prism, and they've decided to stuff the Israel-Palestinian conflict into that lens. And oh, that's why you see these... That's how they see everything. It's oppressor, oppressed. The Jewish people are successful. They're the oppressors, everyone. It, it is so idiotic, but that's their worldview and they will not be dissuaded from it. Let's go to another delusional lefty losing at this time in Canada. Hamas is not okay. a terrorist group. Okay. Hamas is well, what, not a terrorist group. What is it, like a motorcycle it a club? Or? It is a resistance that has been fuming for 75 years of colonialism, of occupation, of murder, of rape, of little children, of women. That's what they are. They are resistance. Do you think Canada is everything, a colonialist country too? Everything that they do is justified. Including what happened thing. last week? Every single thing they have done is justified. Oh, Ma'am, there were children murdered, there were babies beheaded. Oh. Babies beheaded, really. Please educate yourself. I love it when uh, stupid people say, go educate yourself. I mean, it, it is, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the worldview of people like that, what can you do? Even video evidence isn't enough to convince them. And here is an Australian lefty losing it. Uh, Decolonisation, well, what did you think it meant? But when you all examined colonisation and decolonising, what did you actually think that would look like? Like, for real, it is so interesting watching people comment on this. Yeah, like, it's so interesting watching people be shocked. I mean, again, I mean, yes, decolonisation has become a buzzword, but the reality is what we saw mm -hmm. in Israel. Uh, but to then look at people's reactions and, and think it's interesting that they're so shocked, again, there's a callousness there that I find disturbing. It is. It is callous, and they're sort of happy that their their moment has come. I think some of it is, again, these young people just stuffing every issue in the world into that one singular framework of oppressed oppressor, as you mentioned, Rita. There's a second dynamic, too, at play here that's quite consequential, I think, and that is this experiment of mass migration and immigration, illegal and legal, over the past half century in the Western world does lead to this kind of complexity where maybe not these particular people, but there are people who come with different values, different allegiances. This is a very complex conflict going back millennia, and that's why you're seeing it spill out into the streets. Um, it, Europe, I think, most hit by that, where there's five, six, ten percent of the population, you know, comes from a different perspective with this, and that's why I think people are shocked, but maybe shouldn't be. It is the outcome of just when you put together lots of different groups and factions of people, they don't automatically all harmonize and on one worldview. Now, among those who have disgraced themselves with their anti-Israeli sentiments are the Victorian socialists who posted this on social media, solidarity to the Palestinian resistance. They posted that just hours after the so-called resistance had seen people brutalised, people murdered, raped, taken hostage at... Well, Dr Jordan Peterson was none too impressed and he posted this response. He said, you murderous anti-Semitic rats. But eagle-eyed overtime viewers noticed that the cover photo for the Victorian socialist include a young lass who looks rather familiar. Could it be this woman who embarrassed herself on the ABC's Q&A program? talk all this much about uh, individual responsibility. Most of us are never going to be able to afford uh, to have all of these assets to have responsibility over. So what is your advice beyond banal comments like clean your room? Well, you know, it's actually rather difficult to answer a question that ends with your comments are banal, politely. So, you know, I, 
I would, I would consider that more of an opinionated personal and political statement than actually a question. So why don't you try reformulating that so that there's an actual question there. What is your... He then went on to demolish her pseudo-moralistic stance, but always interesting who the ABC give a platform to, isn't it? Victorian socialist, mm. so representative. I wonder if Jordan Peterson himself was eagle-eyed when he responded to that tweet. Did he know that that was her? I don't think years? so. I don't <laughs> think so. But, yeah, it's funny how everything's uh, weirdly connected. Now, we know that Jordan Peterson has changed the lives of many young men in particular, encouraging them to be responsible, productive members of society, beginning by cleaning their own rooms. Perhaps he can do the same for lost young women. Well, I just went to the library because I refuse to give any money to Jordan Peterson. And I got this, his 12 Rules for Life book, and I'm going to read it so I can critique it and expose him for his bigotry and misogyny. Approximately 10 hours later. Well, I cleaned my room and made my bed. And for some strange reason, I'm craving lobster. Very clever skit there from Reality Shannon. Well done. And let's end on an Aussie note. And it doesn't get any more Aussie than a big red kangaroo trying to drown your dog in a river. Oh, I think you're hurting. Look at my dog. <laughs> Akosha, I don't know why he would splash it at the end there. That's just, that's not a good move. You do not want to enrage those big reds any more than they're already enraged. Yeah, that, that footage was remarkable and there's probably an allegory there, Rita, but I can't think of what it is. <laughs> well, that footage is going viral and I love how people around the world are just absolutely terrified of Australian wildlife. They think that we just live in the most dangerous corner of the world. But of course it's not true. I mean, our spiders and snakes can kill you. I think there is something like the highest number of predators here, deadly predators. Okay, you're not helping so. that stereotype with <laughs> so your facts that are it. unhelpful, <laughs> Kosher Gator. Thank you for your time. It was a pleasure. My next guest is a lecturer at the University of Leeds. Dr. Philip Kizzily joins me now. Thank you so much for your time. I want to speak firstly about the protests we have seen around the world. Some of it has been fairly confronting to witness, including this clip from London of a journalist being attacked. I mean, this is truly shocking. Let's have a look at how some Palestinian protesters reacted when they saw this lone man with an Israeli flag. Philip, uh, that's uh, Wahid Beheshti, the man with the Israeli flag. He needed more than a dozen police officers to save him from that mob. If a, if a man with an Israeli flag is enough to incite these people, then what about someone with a, with a kippah or a Star of David? Will Jews need to hide signs of their Jewishness in London? Hi, Rita. Um, it's really nice to speak to you. Um, Yes, I, I, I think that's happening now. Uh, my Jewish friends, I've got lots of very, very close Jewish friends. Um, they just keep their heads down. Uh, and I'm just looking at this footage um, as we're speaking now. And I, I, I can't believe that this is happening uh, in Britain in 2023, but we've had this all weekend. Uh, we have a problem. We have a problem with uh, rabid anti-Semitism. Um, and we have it from a community, a particular community that we're not really allowed to mention it. You know, this is 
We have a large and growing Muslim community in Britain, and there is a large proportion of that community, we're not allowed to say this, but there's a large proportion of that community who are violently anti-Semitic. And you see that, um, that hatred, naked hatred, naked anti-Semitism being paraded through the streets of London, and it's really quite shocking to see. Well, there is a great deal of focus on anti-Semitism when it's from the right. That's called out. It's condemned unequivocally and, and stamped out. But when it comes from the left, when it comes from uh, migrant communities, uh, those who have come from Islamic majority countries, there does seem to be this reluctance to confront it. Yeah, I mean, there used to be... Um, a, a... A, a fair amount of anti-Semitism in, in this country, in the UK, in the 1970s with a political, uh, a small political party called the National Front that gained a little bit of popularity in the mid-1970s. The difference between then and now, and it's a major difference, um, Rita, is that then the um, intelligentsia, the media, uh, academics, the institutions reviled the, the, the National Front because they saw them as being far right, which they which they were, and they undoubtedly were, and they reviled them and rightly so. Now, the, the left, it's not just the hard left. I was going to say it's the hard left, but it's not just the hard left. It's the institutional left. It's 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 academics. Um, it's it's the establishment. The establishment is really quiet on this because there is anti-Semitism in the establishment, you know, the poster boy for mm. uh, leftist anti-Semitism is actually Jeremy Corbyn, and Jeremy Corbyn used to be the leader of His Majesty's opposition. Well, he came within a whisker of becoming Prime Minister. Many expected him to become Prime Minister. He did get trounced by uh, Boris Johnson in the polls. But we have also seen... Um, over the years, uh, many woke corporations who typically love to virtue signal about political and social causes, uh, but they haven't been willing to show their support for Israel over fears of, again, being attacked by the pro-Palestinian brigade. The FA in the UK is a good example of this. They've been criticised for not lighting up the arch at Wembley in the colours of the Israeli flag. Uh, they were very quick to light it up in support of Ukraine at the start of their war with Russia. But, Philip, it seems the FA is fearful that a simple gesture like this that we have seen around the world is going to antagonise people, antagonise some of their fan base. I think what it does, Rita, it just, it just throws into chaos the whole concept the whole idea of anti-racism that everybody's bought into this whole idea of activism we must be activists we must be seen to be anti-racism we are racist we must perform all of these gestures don't forget we had uh, in 2020 we had the world coming to a standstill and everybody taking mm. the knee for a criminal in america george floyd uh, then there was solidarity with uh, with the Ukraine. OK, fair enough. There is nothing now. And yet we are seeing the kind of racism, the kind of naked hatred on the streets of Britain that we have never seen before. These people have, and the institutions as well, uh, uh, institutions like the FA, they, they, they're quick to call out racism in some instances. And these are the kind of people who have been mm. shouting, there are Nazis under the bed. You know, women who want uh, uh, female-only spaces have been called Nazis for wanting female-only spaces. And yet, when there are real Nazi approximations here, people who are calling for the extermination of Jews, which Hamas supporters are doing, uh, everybody is silent. The institutions are silent. Um, and it's and it's scary. I'm scared about the future. I'm worried what's going to happen because if the universities in particular, I'm thinking about the university sector, if they can stay silent, okay, after uh, after what's happened in what happened last week in Israel, where children were getting murdered, where bodies were being desecrated, spat on in the streets, where women were being gang raped. 
If that, to them, is a complex situation, that doesn't seem to be a complex situation to me, that seems to be the simple situation in the world, it's wicked. If that is a complex situation and they're seeing evil on both sides, I'm not seeing any evil from the, from the Israelis, if they're seeing evil on both sides, then there is something deeply wrong with our institutions, our morality, our world is upside down. Uh, this is what Douglas Murray had, has been warning about and many others. Uh, his book, The Strange Death of Europe, comes to mind right now because uh, the signs were there that some of these really ugly ideas were being tolerated and, and uh, cultivated even in the West. Uh, I've heard overnight there's been a number of uh, Jewish schools that have uh, that have closed and there's a couple of schools overnight that have been attacked. Uh, two schools in North London were targeted, vandalised with red paint. Scotland Yard is treating the incidents as hate crimes uh, and the attacks are said to have sent shockwaves through London's Jewish community. Um, and Philip, I do hear that from Jewish people I speak to a lot, that not just London, but, but cities like Paris, Brussels, number of cities throughout Europe, they no longer feel safe. They no longer feel that they can be visibly Jewish, wear a Star of David, wear a kippah, without being fearful of being attacked. Yeah, I think it's very revealing. It says an awful lot about our society and what we've been harboring in our society, that one of the first things that is targeted, you know, the the you know, straight at the top of the list, it's almost, you know, first item of the agenda, nine o'clock on Monday morning, it's schools, it's children. Um mm. if people aren't absolutely outraged by that, if people aren't motivated into action, if people aren't petitioning the police, if people aren't, you know, campaigning on social media, this, this is the time to campaign about anti-racism. This is the time to think about equality and diversity. You know what? If people talk to me about equality and diversity, OK, if people in the institutions talk to me about equality and diversity and they have been silent on, on this, which is the nearest thing we've had to national socialism in this country ever, if they are silent on this, then I think that whole agenda is over. That whole expression of ethical value needs to be um, needs to be reappraised and and I think we're heading that way I think we're heading to that kind of crisis in this country but I don't think it's in this just in this country I think it's in the English speaking world and as you say I think it's in Europe as well we really need to look at ourselves we really need to take this seriously extremely seriously because people are going to die people are terrified people are being intimidated and it's wrong. Dr. Philip Kizzley, thank you so much for your time. Really do appreciate speaking with you. Thank you. Joining me now is author and broadcaster Rabbi Shmuley. Rabbi, some of the anti-Israel rhetoric we have seen in this last week has been absolutely appalling. There is a callousness that, that is disturbing, the way Israelis are dehumanised. And Rabbi, it seems that Israel is the only country that is scrutinised and criticised after its people are attacked by terrorists. Well, look at what happened with your Green Party in Australia, Rita. They actually mm. refused to condemn the Hamas atrocities. Now, when Vladimir Lenin took over the former, you know, created the Soviet Union, took over the Russian Empire, he, ha he created this term, the useful idiots, the stupid, moronic, imbecilic Western intellectuals who supported him even as he instituted a reign of terror that would lead to Stalin killing 30 million Russians. Um, these, the Green Party, all of these people who condemn Israel, they are useful idiots at best, and Hamas themselves are laughing at them because Hamas knows that if they gain power, what they would do, they would kill people like these Western intellectuals, uh, women who walk around even just showing you know, a little bit of cleavage. They, they would be killed. They'd get clitoridectomies. L LBGTQ uh, citizens would be castrated, hung from cranes. So even Hamas laughs at them. They are useful idiots at best, and they are anti-Semites at worst. 
What we're seeing is a global glut, a tsunami of anti-Semitism. It's a 2000 year old hatred. We hoped that it would go underground. And after the Holocaust, where the world barely spoke out against 10,000 Jews being murdered every single day. So 10, you had 10 October 7th, every single day for four years. The world better, barely said a thing. No one would even take the Jews in. It went underground a little bit because even the world was shocked by what their own hatred of the Jews led to. And now, three generations after the Holocaust, we're saying that the world is no longer ashamed, that they, oh, they're they brazen in their anti-Semitism. And I want to just tell all my friends and viewers in Australia, and Rita, thank you for having me so much. You're an amazing friend to me and, and the Jewish community. I'm married to an Australian woman. I love Australia. I lived in Bondi for two years as a, as a teenager. Australians ought to know that Americans are watching them very closely and are shocked by what they see. We are shocked to hear that people were chanting Jews should be gassed mm. outside of this the Sydney Opera House. We are shocked that the Green Party will not condemn the beheading of children. We are shocked that they will not condemn the the murder of 270 people at, at a music festival. Go and try to find a music festival in in, in under Hamas. Uh, anyone that participated, of course, would be shot or imprisoned. We are shocked by what's happening in Australia and. Australians have to reclaim their democracy because remember, it starts with the Jews, we're the canary in the coal mine, it ends with everybody else. So just know what's coming. Islamists, if, if they're not stopped, God forbid you are the next target. Now, you did mention the Greens. Uh, let's have a look at this image from our parliament yesterday. The Greens, uh, we also had a couple of Teal uh, MPs, Kylie Tink and Sophie Scramps and Tasmanian MP Andrew Wilkie, refusing to support a motion to condemn Hamas. Uh, I didn't think these far leftists could get much lower, but here we are. The MPs backed an attempt by Greens leader Adam Band to amend the bipartisan motion. They wanted to accuse Israel of war crimes and sought to erase a statement declaring Australia stands with Israel and recognises its inherent right to defend itself. Rabbi, what would you say to those who accuse Israel of committing war crimes like the like the Greens? Um, th this entire war is about war crimes. It's about the war crimes of Hamas against the Israeli people and against the Palestinian people. Let's remember that Hamas uh, was elected. You know, when it, first of all, when everyone says that Palestinians are, are, are blameless, you know, would it were that that were completely true? It's probably partially true. Children, of course, are blameless. But it, the Palestinian people in Gaza elected Hamas in 2006. Now, it is true that Hamas immediately de uh, declared a dictatorship, just like Adolf Hitler was democratically elected by the German people, but he created a dictatorship. But every time Israelis get murdered, the people all over the Gaza Strip, they they, they dance, they sing. When 3,000 Americans were incinerated uh, on 9-11, 2001, the people in, uh, in Gaza, they danced, they sang about Americans and international citizens having to jump 101 floors to their deaths. Um, there's never been any serious resistance to Hamas, even though Hamas is a, a terrorist organization. So I don't blame the people of Gaza, but to say that they're entirely blameless, they have to rise up against Hamas because Hamas has destroyed their lives. When you speak about war crimes, what do people expect Israel to do? Just let their citizens die and, and never, and then they use the, the word retaliate. You know, we Jews only retaliate. We're, we're vengeful. We're not allowed to protect our citizens. This is a form of, re of revenge. No, it's not. Israel just wants to be left in peace. They want Arabs and Jews to live together in peace. All of the carnage and destruction that we're seeing right now in these images uh, as I'm speaking is the responsibility of Hamas. Who was responsible for the destruction of Germany in the Second World War? Who was responsible for the destruction of Japan? Was it Winston Churchill? Was he a war criminal? Was it um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt? Was he a war criminal? We consider those two men the greatest two statesmen of the 20th century. Hitler was responsible for the destruction of Germany. The, the, the emperor of Japan, uh, Hirohito, was responsible for the destruction of Japan. When you launch aggressive war and incinerate and destroy uh, innocent lives, and then Western democracies fight just to establish civilization again, you cannot blame those democracies for being civilized and trying to uproot the barbarity in our midst. Over the last uh, week, we have seen plenty of protests in the West, uh, from Melbourne and Sydney to London and New York, uh, for the Palestinian cause. But we are now seeing some data coming in showing overwhelming support for Israel and Israel's right to defend itself. CNN found 71% of Americans call Israel's defensive war justified. Uh, whilst Washington Post has 78% saying support for Israel is appropriate. 
or insufficient. Only 18% say it's too much. Uh, Rabbi, there's a great deal of goodwill for the only Jewish state, perhaps not amongst academia and celebrities and, and leftist politicians, but the general public is largely supportive. Because the general public are people of decency. They just want to raise their children and be safe. When they see that children are burned to death, when they see that women are raped um, and murdered, and when they see that these fraudulent, fake snake oil salesmen, Hamas, who call themselves religious. I love, I love the way we call them religious extremists. Let's remember Hamas took either an unconscious or dead Israeli woman. Um, we don't know uh, her status. She was in her bra and her underwear, and they paraded her body around in Gaza. These religious, disgusting, prurient men who were almost advertising that they're into necrophilia. You're talking about sickos. You're talking about a, a level of, of a demented morality, the likes of which the Western world has almost never seen, and who, which the Palestinians seem kind of okay with. Where was the disgust on the part of imams? Oh, you hate Jews? Okay, you hate Jews, but they're dragging around a woman in her bra and her underwear, and you claim to be religious? You guys are sick. You're a disgrace to Islam. You're a fraudulent snake oil salesman. As far as um, academia, uh, there's... I don't know how much hope there is for our universities anymore. That Harvard students are actually siding mm. with terrorists is, uh, I can't find the words. I was the rabbi at Oxford University for 11 years. Maybe I shouldn't be surprised. But I'll tell you something. You know, Alicia Keys apparently just posted and removed, immediately removed, a post, Alicia Keys, where she yeah. said, what are all you thinking you would do if you weren't afraid? And she says, I'm thinking of paragliding. Let me repeat that. Alicia Keys, a singer, just said she's thinking of paragliding. You're thinking of paragliding what? Into Israel and shooting and killing people? How, how, you know, I, I, again, I'm struggling to find the words because we're all in a state of shock. Well, BLM Chicago. The world has no morality. Uh, well, the BLM Chicago used that image of a paraglider to express their support for for the Palestinian cause. Uh, so it's incredibly, I don't know, callous and cover it to, to be using that image when they know those paragliders went to that music festival and raped and slaughtered and uh, took hostages back to Gaza from there. I mean, it, there's, there's nothing there that's remotely defendable and yet it's become an image. And we saw protesters again in Europe who had the image of uh, paragliders on their back. Uh, it's It's... It's astonishing. You mentioned Alicia Keys, but it's not just that those who are siding with the with the Palestinian cause. It's the silence of some of, some of the world's biggest celebrities. The same people who couldn't wait to stand with BLM despite their neo-Marxist uh, origins. Uh, they they are happy to virtue signal about global warming, uh, sexism, every issue, but. When it comes to this issue, they have been silent. And I noticed Kylie Jenner was another one who actually put up a post expressing solidarity with Israel and then she took it down straight away because, I don't know, there was a backlash, her celebrity friends uh, counselled her against it. I don't know what, what the reason was to remove it, Rabbi, but, I mean, the girl's a billionaire. Find some courage. Yeah, well, Kylie Jenner's father, Caitlyn Jenner, is a very dear friend. And a few years ago, we honored her for her support of Israel. She has been undaunted in her public support. And when she gave a speech in central Manhattan as to why she supports Israel, she says that she said that I'm a transgender woman. If I went north of Israel, I'd be beheaded. If I went west to Iran, I'd be sorry, east to Iran, I'd be disemboweled. If I went west to, to, to Hamas and Gaza, uh, I would be immediately murdered. And therefore, I stand with Israel. This is the simplest moral issue around. A liberal democracy where women have rights, LGBTQ uh, uh, citizens have rights, Arab Palestinians have rights, Jews have rights, and it's a multicultural, multi-ethnic society where Arabs serve, of course, in on the Supreme Court. There was an Arab judge that put an Israeli Jewish president of Israel in jail for uh, uh, allegedly uh, raping a woman. That's how righteous Israel is in its equality and fairness. And now you have these Western useful idiots who have no morality, they have no moral compass, they are an absolute disgrace and humiliation to Western democracy, Western culture, to basic values. And we're stupid enough to look at, to them for moral guidance. Why would I look to, to Alicia Keys or Kylie? I'll look, go, you wanna, if you wanna see some woman pruriently showing her body, go take 
pictures on Instagram with Kylie Jenner. But if you want morality, go to people who actually courageously fight evil. So when we speak, uh, especially, Rita, about what you said, that the majority of Westerners, people in the United States, support Israel, that's not enough because they cannot be a silent majority. There has, has to be a time where people pay a price for their immorality. I am thrilled that there are trucks going around Harvard that show the pictures of the students who signed a petition condemning Israel and saying that Israel deserved these terrorist attacks. They deserve the beheading of babies. I'm thrilled that there's trucks going around showing their pictures. You know, if you, if you hate Israel and you're an anti-Semite, flaunt it. Don't be ashamed. You know, Hitler wasn't ashamed of being an anti-Semite. He was proud of it. The Nazis weren't ashamed. They were proud of it. If you, the Green Party, just get up and say, we hate Jews, and we think Jews are horrible, and we don't care when they die. And the people in Hollywood should say the same thing. Kylie Jenner should say, look, I'm kind of indifferent about Jews. I'd like to say something. But, you know, Jews dying is is kind of less important to me than my next, uh, you know, endorsement uh, with uh, some company that's going to pay me a fortune. Just be proud of it. Be proud of your anti-Semitism. I, I, I respect those. I don't respect their disgusting, dark character, but at least I respect, respect their moral convictions when they don't pretend to be something they're not. It is time for the anti-Semites, for the Green Party. It's time for so many of these people in Hollywood. It's time for BLM Chicago to come out and say, we hate Jews. We think that Jews are kind of vermin. We, we, we don't care when they die. They're not really human. They've never been human to us. And at least the world will then know what we're up against. So that's where I'm at right now. I am here to finally fight. Take, we have to take the gloves off and morally express our outrage. Not a day of rage, like Hamas called for last week, which is violence, but a day of outrage, a day of moral outrage. Let us publicly out all the, out all the anti-Semites. Let us ensure that our businesses do not do not hire them. Bill Ackman, one of the biggest billionaires here in the United States, announced that he and his CEOs were circulating the names of these Harvard students to ensure that they never hired them by accident. And you know what all those Oxford, those, those Harvard students did? They all ran and removed their names because they even their hatred of Jews still is not as great as their love of money. They want very high-paying jobs. They have no morality. <laughs> they have no moral compass. They have no humanitarianism. They don't give a damn about Palestinians. They couldn't care less if Arabs die, because if they did, they would be on the front lines protesting that Syria killed 600,000 Arabs over the past decade. 600,000 Arabs. And where do you even hear the name Bashar al-Assad? The UN didn't, didn't pass one Security Council resolution against Assad, who killed more Arabs than any man in history, with the sole exception of Saddam Hussein. Nobody, these people don't care about Arab life. They hate Jews, they hate Jews, they hate Jews. Rabbi Shmuley, always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for your insights. Rita, Rita, and Rita, I need to just tell you, in a time where the Jews are under global assault, in a time when I watch my daughters who are, you know, we have 10 young grandchildren, cry the whole Shabbat over, not only over the murder in Israel, of course, and I have two sons serving in the IDF right now, and I have a son that's getting married. He's in the IDF, and we're all going to Israel, 20 of us, God willing, in the middle of this war. My daughters were crying because they cannot believe the global assault on Jew Jewry. I want you to know and I hope that your producers will keep this part of the segment in, how much we love and respect and appreciate your moral courage. The Jewish people have very few friends. You are one of our, our boldest and most courageous. God bless you. Oh, thank you, Rabbi. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rita. Joining me now is that incorrigible Texan himself. He is an AOC fanboy and comic, Alex Stein. Alex, you have been, frankly, out of control in recent days. I'm worried that I'm going to have to start some sort of a GoFundMe in the near future to bail you out of jail. Let's just have a look at some of your recent antics. Here you are mocking the suicidal idiocy of LGBT activists who protest for Palestine, a place where they wouldn't last five minutes. Here you present your case to Plano Council in Texas. I'm here representing Gays for Palestine. We're an organization representing the 2SL LGBTQIA plus community that stands with the persecuted Muslims who just want a jihad in peace, all right? So, a lot of people are rushing to judgment against the Palestinians right now because of the stuff they are seeing on TV. I just want to say, a lot of people have misconceptions about Palestine. Mia Khalifa, one of the most popular porn stars in America, who has done a bunch of lesbian scenes, is standing with the Palestinians. And just because they've thrown a few of my allies off of roofs in the past, that doesn't make them bad people. We must look past that. 
Because, you know, this is 2024. Palestine is changing. And just because gay people have had to run to Israel for protection in the past doesn't mean anything. We love that their women have very little rights. That's why they have such few traffic accidents. So we agree on more than you think. Palestine is on its way in the gay direction. Alex, I have a, a lot of questions, but first let's not miss out on this song you wrote for the occasion. I'll say it one more time. All the gays of Palestine, all the gays of Palestine, all the gays of Palestine. <laughs> That's the um, only section of the song that we could play. Alex, please explain yourself. Well, Rita, you know that I'm insane and that I'm crazy, but what I do is called culture jamming. Like I take the most absurd parts of our culture and I try to jam it in people's faces to bring awareness to it. And there's nothing more hypocritical in this entire world than seeing the LGBTQ community coming out in support of Hamas, basically. I mean, you would think that this was a joke written by Saturday Night Live, but this is a real thing. And if they were to go to Palestine, they would literally be thrown off a roof. I mean, that's not hyperbole. That literally happened. So it's just kind of shocking, I guess you would say, that people have such strongholds in their identity politics that they can't even, you know, see the nuance of supporting an organization that literally wants to kill people because of their sexual orientation. The only place members of the LGBT community are safe in the Middle East is in Israel. And yet they, they're, they're doing that. It is beyond belief. Uh, let's cross to Chicago where uh, the folks are finding out that elections have consequences. More than 80 percent of them voted for Joe Biden in 2020 and they haven't had a Republican mayor since 1931. Well, they're finding out the hard way that being a sanctuary city, well, it comes with some grim consequences. How disrespectful that is to him. You don't have that right to do that to us. And we're not responsible. Y'all need to go to the root of the problem. You need to stop the busing, stop Sanctuary City, and it's not us against them. You all need to take care of it and quit crying to tell us this bull crap that you sitting up here telling. We won't stand for this. We say no. Thank you. This is our community, and you just don't dump anything on us and expect us to accept it, okay? That is not what we pay our taxes for. Alex, the, the residents there are clearly unhappy. They're unhappy about the illegal migrants uh, flooding the city, but <laughs> this is what they voted for at both local and national elections. The Democrats were clear in their policies. It was Trump and the Republicans who wanted to build that wall the last time I checked. Well, you know, Rita, a lot of conservatives will tell you that systemic racism does not exist, but I, I disagree. I feel like black people have been marginalized in this country for uh, definitely the liberal, uh, the liberal Democrat Party, for sure. They even started the KKK. So now seeing the black community in Chicago fall victim to the policies that they thought they voted for that would help them, that it would help the struggling people that can't pay their bills, can't afford to fill up their gas tank. But instead, they want to allocate our funds to help out Venezuelans with criminal history or sex traffickers or connections to the cartels in Mexico. When all these people want is a little help for American, American citizens, America first. But sadly, Rita, they do not care about American citizens because if they did, there wouldn't be 22 military veterans that commit suicide every day here in America. So you can just look at how we treat our military vets and then extrapolate that to the marginalized communities. They get it even worse, in my opinion. Well, we have seen also similar protests in New York, another sanctuary city. But Alex, uh, they are getting illegal migrants there and it is having an impact, but it is a fraction of the numbers that you see in, in Texas. So really, these border towns uh, in Texas and Arizona have... Uh, been dealing with this for years. It's only when your governor and uh, Ron DeSantis too from Florida started bussing these migrants to, to these uh, blue cities that they're getting a taste of the policies they, they support. And New York doesn't have the infrastructure. I'm here in New York, the Roosevelt Hotel on 45th Street. I walked by it and it was just a bunch of basically like military-aged 
Venezuelan men. I mean, they look like they were all could do a job, they could work, but instead they can come here to America and just get a free hotel room right next to Times Square, basically. And listen, I'm not anti-immigration. If somebody wants to come to school here, somebody wants to work in America, God bless them. This is a melting pot. I'm all for it. But the sad reality is that the Venezuelans or the other illegal immigrants that are coming here are not held to the same standard. If they commit a crime, they're not held accountable like I would be. So we have a two-tier justice system that is benefiting criminals, literally criminals. I mean, as soon as you come here illegally, you're considered a criminal in my book. Yet you get a free hotel room. You get a free air-conditioned bus ride. You get three meals a day. Um, and, and we're encouraging it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have the doors are welded open, not welded shut. So I'm not anti-immigration, but I am anti-sex trafficking and anti-drug trafficking. And they're using this immigration push as a way to smuggle in a lot of bad things that, unfortunately, I think it's only going to get worse. Oh, you can be pro-migration and be pro-illegal migration. Illegal immigration is is completely a different equation. And, uh, yeah, America has created a pull factor. You're always going to have the push factors, but you are creating a, a very uh, comfortable environment for people to cross that border illegally. Now, let's talk a little bit about Jada Pinkett Smith. Uh, Meghan Markle's uh, crown as the worst wife possibly has been <laughs> seized by Jada Pinkett Smith as a woman who not only humiliated Will Smith by having a sexual relationship with her son's best mate, but she then made him explore that humiliation in a podcast. Then I got into an entanglement with August. That's what I said. An entanglement? Yes. <laughs> Yes. A relationship. Yes, it was a relationship. Absolutely. I was in a lot of pain and I was very broken. Now, in the process of that relationship, I definitely realized that you can't find happiness outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. And luckily enough, you and I were also going through a process of healing in a much different manner. Now, after that humiliation came the infamous Oscars slap that has uh, really destroyed Will Smith's image, reputation. He was among the most bankable stars in Hollywood before he felt the need to defend Jada's honour. And now Alex, in a new memoir no one asked for, Jada claims that her and Will have been separated for seven years and her big issue with that slap was the fact that Will then called her his wife. Will then went on a profane tirade warning Chris not to mention his wife's name. Jada couldn't believe what she was hearing. What is going on? Now, first of all, I'm really shocked because, mind you, I'm not there. We haven't called each other husband and wife yeah. in a long time. But I'm like, what is going on I right keep now? my wife's, wife's name. name out of your yes. mouth, yes. right? And yes. I'm like... Alex, what do you make of this? Why is Will Smith still legally married to her, even if she says they're not husband and wife in her eyes? Uh, is he a hostage? Well, I mean, you know that these relationships are very complicated, but just the sheer fact that she's using the old Hollywood playbook of being a victim, somehow her husband standing up for her, you know, defending her honor, at least that's what he thought he was doing, but because he called her his wife, which they were publicly, even though, you know, they were secretly uh, estranged, but they were publicly together. And of course, Jada Pinkett Smith can find a way to become a victim. You said it best at the beginning of this interview. Jada Pinkett Smith wins the award for worst wife of, you know, ever, probably. <laughs> I mean, just you had him on that, that interview talking about her cheating on him publicly like that. I mean, that's just so disrespectful to your husband. I couldn't imagine the pain that that, that, that cost Will. Oh, I mean, infidelity in Hollywood, I'm sure, is nothing new. Uh, the, the moral compass is different to probably the rest of the country. But even in Hollywood, you normally wouldn't get the partner you've cheated on on camera to discuss how he feels about being cheated on and how you feel about why you cheated and, and the, never mind that it was your son's friend that you shacked up with. I mean, the whole thing is so twisted. Alex Stein, it's always a pleasure. Thank you, Rita.
That's all for today's program. I'll be back Friday night, 7 p.m. for the Rita Panahi Show and on Sunday morning with Outsiders. I'll see you then.